uh, tuning in. Um, I'm really happy to um, introduce Sally Greenberg. I wish she would have been able to come in person, but with that hurricane, travel was a little screwed up. So we're happy to have her remotely. Um, Sally was actually one of the first students um, I taught at Alfred. Uh, I came in 88, she came in 91. She graduated um, with a bachelor's degree in geology. Um, and then she went to the University of Illinois and got a master's degree in geochemistry. Uh, after that, she worked for a while, I'm doing this all from my head here, Sally, worked for a while for the Illinois State Geological Survey as a isotope geochemist. Um, while she was doing that, she also got a PhD from the University of Illinois in education. Um, and then since then, she has really pivoted a bit um, and she's been working a lot on carbon, carbon sequestration and doing some incredibly cool stuff with, with that. Um, she tells me she was even considered at one point for a position in the Biden administration with the, uh, the work that she does. She travels all over the place. And I'm just gonna turn it over to Sally and hear some pearls of wisdom. Thank you so much, Michelle. Let me switch. Hopefully you can see that in uh, presenter mode. Yep. Great. <clears throat> so I'm super, super happy to be here and very sad that I was not able to be at Alfred in person. I really was looking forward to um, the drive down from Rochester and a chance to visit with Michelle and to meet all of you in person. But I, if I've learned nothing in my 30 years since leaving Alfred and traveling a lot, it's best not to fly into the face of a hurricane. Um, <clears throat> and so, you know, Michelle gave you a bit of my background. I've been actively engaged in the field of energy and carbon capture and storage uh, in, for about the last 30 years. I look a lot at the place where science, society, and the environment meet. And the place that I learned to do that was at Alfred. And so I want to take you through a bit of my own personal journey, give you some insights into some of the science that I've done, but also all the other things that have happened uh, kind of along the way. And, um, and really encourage those of you who are students and who are thinking about your future <clears throat> to look broadly and to, um, and to seek opportunities in places where you might not uh, recognize that they're available to you. So um, today I wanna talk to you about getting comfortable being uncomfortable and using that as a pathway for engaging in the world. When I was 25, I was a secretary at an investment bank and I had a flash to the future. I was a quarter of a century old and I asked myself, is this what I wanted to be doing in 40 years? It was also the 20th anniversary of the first Earth Day. And there was a resurgence of the environmental movement and somehow without really knowing any of the details, I knew that this was the path that I wanted to follow. So I upended everything. And I applied to several schools for environmental science and picked Alfred because they gave me the most financial aid. I was literally turning my life upside down, quitting my job, and I figured I could use all the help that I could get. Fast forward two years to my first day in Alfred, where I, I drove into that one road river valley with the university on one side and the tech on the other. There were no stop signs two bars and I turned my asked my friend who was driving to turn the car around and go back to Chicago because I was sure that I had made a mistake. And so I felt a, a cocktail of dread, excitement, ambiguity, and a whole lot of, oh my God, what have I done? But I was stuck. I didn't have my own car and I had no way out. So thank goodness for Manhattan West and Alex's. Talk about being uncomfortable. Suddenly I was a, an old woman at 28, a beginner in science, living in a dorm with 18 year olds and doing calculus for the first time in 10 years. In order to succeed at Alfred, I had to get comfortable being uncomfortable. And we are currently living in an unprecedented time of discomfort. And I don't know about you, but I'm exhausted by it. Some people really thrive in this space and others will do anything to avoid it. 
What we all have in common though, is that we often seek change when we feel uncomfortable and change is central to life. So I have a radical suggestion. What about instead of avoiding discomfort, we embrace it instead. And what I've learned is that discomfort is a place of opportunity. This is me with Jennifer Granholm, who's the current Secretary of Energy of the United States. In my first meeting with Michelle Lukey at Alfred, she said to me, I know you're here to study environmental science, but I recommend you double major in one of the hard sciences, physics, chemistry, or geology. And she told me that I could have more of an impact on the environment, environment if I approached it from a factual-based physical science. I had never studied science. I didn't really like science. Maybe I didn't even know what environmental science was, you might be thinking. I was afraid of math. And as a girl in elementary school, I had been told that I was bad at those things. So not only had everything in my environment changed around me, I was suddenly changing my own paradigm by becoming a woman in science and tackling lifelong stereotypes. But I realized that if I adopted this fact-based centered approach and had a plan that I could make an impact and do something that really, really mattered. When I was a student there, um, uh, Gordon Godshock taught a class on environmental issues debate. And he used a textbook that presented, supposedly presented the pros and the cons of an issue. And then he divided us up into partners and we were supposed to present our argument and do it in front of the class and have a debate. And it was the most biased book I think I've ever encountered. And it, there was super um, positive on the con side and very abrupt on the pro side. So if you had the pro side of an issue, you really didn't have a lot of material to work with. And what I learned from that experience, and it, Michelle might remember this, I wrote a letter to the editor of that book because I was so annoyed by it. Um, but what I really learned was that how important and uncomfortable it can be holding the middle holding a space where there are things that you don't agree with, and, but you need to understand and that the world is not really a black and white place. And I also learned that where you put your energy matters and what matters is where you put your energy. And the way that I think about matter is that matter is clarity of purpose. It can be a noun, like we learn in science, cannot be created or destroyed. It can change form, but is always conserved. But matter can also be a verb, a way of being or doing. And you know what matters because you can feel it. You feel it here and it's your North Star. So I am not gonna lie to you. I struggled so hard that first year at Alfred. And Michelle got me an internship at the University of Illinois uh, the next summer. And for me, that was a turning point. The minute I got into the laboratory and started to do clay mineralogy and real science, I lit up. I found myself identifying rocks, crushing them into smaller pieces for analysis, grinding, weighing, baking, using centrifuges, ovens, all kinds of things. For me, everything was fun, like playing in a sandbox. And I was hooked so hooked that by the time I got back to Alfred that fall, I said to Michelle, I wanna be a geologist. And so by now I'm hoping you're asking, how are you supposed to use your own discomfort to figure out what matters? I created this cycle of matter to dial into what resonates for me and to use that as a roadmap for making a difference. And I'm sure that, excuse me, that it can work for you too. Because what I learned along the way since in the 30 years since I left Alfred, Alfred, is that science and real life are not that different. Science is poetry. It's about making order from chaos. And as I started to embody how science worked, I realized that life follows a similar sense-making process. And the cycle of matter are the five steps that I use to learn, grow, and dive into my, my discomfort to make change occur. So the first step in the cycle is gathering. 
<clears throat> excuse me. In this mode, I'm an observer. I gather what is interesting or what lands, what's shiny. It's about what makes you curious. It's an observational mood, an openness to what's around you, ideas, people, experiences, paying attention to everything. So for me, this was being open to upending my life and doing some com something completely new. The next step is sorting. And sorting is about categorizing inputs, decluttering what's not meaningful for you, looking at what you have. Are there themes, commonalities, what's not there? What do you want more of? What sparks your interest? For me, this was all the things in my environment that drove me towards a career in the environmental sciences. And then you connect. And connecting for me is about being lit up. It's about forming a hypothesis about relationships, bringing pieces together that resonate or shine that matter to you. It's about what's unique to you and what do you want to focus on? Like the day that I realized I wanted to be a geologist. And so gathering, sorting and connecting. This part of the cycle is about getting clear about what matters. And for me, for a long time, this phase was enough. But as I got deeper into my career, I needed more and I was starting to get uncomfortable again. I had a lot of questions, but no logical path. And I had to sit at this plateau, excuse me, for a long time to figure out what I wanted. And this whole time I was working as an isotope geochemist, but I wanted to have a greater impact and connection to what matters, attracts what you want, and having a plan to get there is what allows you to realize that impact. So a decade has gone by, and uh, that whole time I was working as an isotope geochemist at the Illinois State Geological Survey, where I still work today, but my discomfort was telling me there had to be more. I could not put my finger on how to find it or what was my next step. And then I had a chance encounter in the hallway with a gentleman by the name of Rob Finley, who asked me to be part of a geologic carbon storage project. And I quickly realized that his side project was a place where all of the work that I had done, everything that I had learned at Alfred, all the things I was doing in science could come together. And at this moment, the door blew off of my career. And suddenly there were strategic opportunities everywhere for me to have an impact. And this happened in about 2003. And I wanna tell you a little bit about where that chance encounter has taken me and some of the work that I've been doing for the last 20 years. So I've been heavily involved in a program funded by the Department of Energy called the Regional Carbon Sequestration Partnership Program, um, whose effort, uh, through whose efforts we have been demonstrating the viability of carbon storage as a climate change mitigation strategy. And for those of you who know or don't know, carbon capture and storage is a value chain whereby we capture carbon dioxide from point sources. In my case, my project was an ethanol plant um, and you, uh, you usually build a pipeline to trans that carbon transport that carbon dioxide to a deep underground well where you're injecting into a sandstone. So the things that we're concerned about with respect to carbon capture and storage is proving whether or not you have the capacity, so the pore space and permeability in order to store that carbon dioxide, the injectivity, how much can you put into, uh, how much carbon can you divert from, from the atmosphere and store in a rock, and containment. Do you have secondary um, uh, trapping mechanisms such as a shale or something that allows you to have a suitable storage container? So this little picture you see here is me, Rob Finley, and a couple of other colleagues from Schlumberger and Archer Daniels Midland on the day that we started a project which has now stored a million tons of carbon dioxide in the subsurface in Decatur, Illinois. A project that ultimately uh, Dr. Finley retired and I took over and brought to a close last year in 2021. 
Um, one of the major things that we did throughout that project was we tested and demonstrated a significant number of monitoring technologies to answer the question of how do we know that CO2 is behaving as we anticipate it to do in the subsurface. And so a lot of um, uh, thinking about risk and verifying storage and environmental monitoring. Now, I just like to tell you that I didn't learn the majority of this at Alfred. I learned this as I went. I didn't know anything about how to drill a well or what a, what a drilling rig looked like or wireline tools or any of that sort of thing. But you will find that you learn what you need to learn as you go. Um, and so what this work has led to is actually a program in Illinois whereby we have had multiple projects that demonstrate the entire value chain of capturing carbon dioxide from a point source and storing that in the, in the subsurface, as I mentioned before, and that has built. So my project stored a million tons of carbon dioxide. That led to a second project in uh, co-located where the injection wells are about a mile apart. That project has now stored about three and a half million tons of carbon dioxide. And all of that work has been leveraged for several programs looking at characterization of subsurface to store up to 50 million tons of carbon dioxide in the Illinois basin. And that's just one of many projects similar or suite of projects similar to that across the country. And so just a little bit um, about my pride and joy, the Illinois Basin Decatur project, which is seen here. Some of the things that we are uh, achieved are, is that we captured, transported, stored, and monitored a million tons of carbon dioxide from ethanol production. So the actual first bioenergy CCS project. We had a first of a kind monitoring, verification, and accounting program. We proved storage potential injectivity and containment. We had the first successful permitting structure under the US Environmental Protection Agency. We laid the foundation, like I was just talking about, for many, many different projects. We built international, national, and regional capacity. We've had more than 2,000 visitors from over 30 countries to this project. And we created, <clears throat> I created, a stakeholder engagement strategy that built trusted relationships, which are still bearing fruit today. And and we made public not too long ago a comprehensive data set that shares all of the data from this project. And what did I learn the whole way by doing this? Is that chance favors the prepared mind. And by having yourself open to opportunity, then those opportunities will come to you. But it's really good to have a plan. And the fourth step of the cycle of matter is about strategy. And strategizing is about building a plan from, to make the shift from where you are right now to where you wanna be. Create a vision, set goals, figure out how to use what you have combined with who you know and what you bring to the table. Um, and that's what's been playing out for me for the last 20 years. And what I realized was that my vision in this whole time period was to build a framework that explored uncomfortable ideas and connect and the connections between science, society, and the environment, and to do that through having hard conversations. And once I recognized the opportunity for impact in that area, the door was open and the opportunities just continue to flow in. In fact, I can't say no fast enough these days. And every time I say no, I'm sure that it's gonna be the last time that somebody asks me for something. And yet five more invitations to do something come in the door, maybe on that same day. And so by taking all the concepts from science into life, I realized that change actually can happen in a super big way. And you've been training for this your whole lives. So change is the fifth and final implementation step. And it's about ha having hard conversations as a cornerstone for change to actually happen. At least that's what it's about for me. And this is a, a time period where having hard conversations is really easy to do. So about 15 years ago is when most of this really changed for me. And I was at an open house giving a demonstration that showed what carbon storage is, how it works, why it works, 
and how we knew it was safe. And I was super, super focused on the details of the science. And my audience was a group of farmers and landowners. And I made the assumption going in that what was important to me is what was important to them. So I'm in the middle of this super scientific spiel and a farmer interrupted me and he said, yeah, yeah, I get it. I understand what's gonna happen. But what I wanna know is, are you gonna dig up my driveway and what is this gonna do to my property value? And his question stopped me in my tracks and I realized, oh, this is what matters to him. It isn't only what matters to me. And I was pretty off base about what mattered to him. In order to connect with him though, I needed to hear what mattered to him, even if it made me uncomfortable or I didn't have the answer. And let me take a minute to highlight some of the other things that I've learned along the way that I didn't know I need or didn't know I needed, but Alfred prepared me so well to embrace. And so these are all areas that I highly recommend you explore and seek to understand. And one of the best assets that you have to bring into this in, is to bring science into areas like the things I'm talking about here where it's needed. And it's also a rich and meaningful place to find jobs. So policy is one of those spaces where we need a lot of people who understand science and how it works and who can make realistic policies about air pollution control or um, managing the um, incentives to drive environmental behavior, a lot of different ways in which science plays into policy. Funding is one example. So right now, there is a tremendous amount of funding available through some, some policies that you may have heard about the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, the IIJA, or some people call it the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, BIL. Uh, there's something that just passed recently called the uh, Inflation Reduction Act. Those are two policies that put a lot of funding into the area of carbon capture, utilization and storage, energy transition, making sure that there are fair and equitable jobs, um, there's just an enormous amount of work to do in this area. And if anybody is interested, I'll put this plug in now, at getting a job at the Department of Energy, they are hiring like crazy right now. And I highly recommend that you um, seek uh, information about that. And if you, if you want, you can connect with me and I can try and put you in, in touch with people that I know at the department. Um, regulations is another area. So understanding how underground injection control works and what are the regulatory frameworks that are in place to do subsurface activities. Not only is this important from a national perspective, but I've had the opportunity to contribute to regula regulatory frameworks around the world because of the work that we've done here in the United States. Standards is another place where you have the opportunity to have influence. So once you have worked on something for 25 years like I have, and you're one of the first who understands best practices related to, to storing carbon dioxide, for example, you can participate in things like the International Standards Organization development of a standard for carbon storage, which I and many, many of my colleagues uh, contributed to. So there's lots of ways in which your science plays out in, in, in the real world, if you want. If, if, so to speak. And then a place that's near and dear to my heart is stakeholder engagement. And I have done a lot of my research has been in this area. And Michelle mentioned my PhD, which is in secondary and continuing education, which was really a way to understand social science methods and connect those with physical science methods so that I could understand how people interpret and what they care about with respect to the environment and society. So some of the basic principles of engagement that I have uh, participated in and contributed to is, um, you know, and I think these are good for everybody to know because you're going to communicate about your science is understanding what your local community context is, being able to exchange information, 
in a two-way conversation, identifying the appropriate levels of engagement, discussing risks and benefits, and then finding ways to continue that engagement through an entire project, which in the case of carbon capture and storage can be up to 50 years. So how do you do that is a really, really interesting question. Um, and then this is one of my favorite things. And this is a realization I came to probably about the same time I was having that conversation with those farmers. And that is that the questions that I hear from the public about science are almost the exact same questions we are trying to answer ourselves. We're just using different words. So a good example is I often hear from people, how do you know that carbon dioxide is gonna stay in the ground where you put it? Well, I showed you that slide with all those monitoring technologies that we've been testing for two decades. That's how we know the answer to that question. And we have a whole field of study that supports continued innovative ways to monitor lots of things in the subsurface, not just carbon dioxide. What happens in the event of an earthquake? Are you gonna cause an earthquake? Or are you, or are you going to um, create a situation where you have a catastrophic release of carbon dioxide? Those are two super different questions, both very reasonable to research and to understand, but you have to listen kind of carefully when you're talking to the public to hear which of those questions it is that they're really asking you. So anyways, this is a list of questions that's really served me well uh, for the last decade or so. Um, and the area most recently where I've been doing a deep dive is in the area of environmental justice and how does that connect to carbon capture and storage and stakeholder engagement and the energy transition. And this is such an interesting and important space to be working right now. And talk about a place where you can have a lot of uncomfortable conversations no shortage of opportunity for that. And, you know, but I'm dedicated to really finding answers and ways to hold the middle, as I said before, and to be a bridge to have conversations between communities that feel like they have not been treated fairly for, in, for generations uh, that have been left behind by the government, who, you know, are front, front fence line, excuse me, fence line communities. Um, you know, that have suffered uh, uh, health issues and a, a variety of impacts from industrial uh, activities, as well as understanding uh, industry and what commercially are our best options for climate change mitigation and how do we go about balancing all of that so that we can make progress and uh, have solutions-based approaches to problem solving. So this brings me back to the cycle of matter. And I invite you to cultivate this cycle of matter with me together. Let's gather, sort, connect, and strategize for change in the world. And this is how I want to be in the world at this moment. I want to be present in this and so many moments of discomfort. Because I want to live in a world where girls are free to embrace math and science, a world where people come together instead of being split apart, where hard conversations are the norm, a world that's got less chaos with respect and kindness and understanding, and a world that is solutions-based with logic and order, a world where things are just easier for me, for you, and for everyone because that is what matters. Okay, thank you, Sally. Um, yeah, I see some uh, virtual, I don't even have my video on here. <laughs> Claps, okay. Um, so let's open it up for questions and let's try, we'll see if it gets too crazy, but let's just try people just shouting out their questions or turning on your, turning off your mute and asking a question. And I'd love to see faces if there are some faces. <laughs> Since if we had been in the same room, I would have been able to make eye contact with all of you. All right, students, come on, turn your cameras on. Yay, good, good Yay. job, Brandon. <laughs> 
I'll, I'll throw a question out. I was just wondering if you could touch on when, um, when you went back to school and when you made that decision to go back for your PhD, because it seemed like that might've been later. Yeah. <laughs> yes, indeed. So thank you for that question, Nicole. I am, uh, my exit strategy from the University of Illinois, which clearly didn't work out, um, was in about 2005, actually a little bit before 2005, um, I decided I was going to do a PhD because I was kind of bored doing geo, uh, I took geochemistry. Um, Board isn't quite the right word, but it was a very laboratory focused um, job, which I loved, but not a lot of room for growth. And so, you know, when you're looking for sort of what is your next logical step, sometimes that's to do another degree. And so, you know, I live in a community like you do where, you know, it's kind of unusual not to have a PhD. So I was like, oh yeah, sure, I'll do a PhD. And, um, and I could do it uh, tuition free through the University of Illinois because the Illinois State Geological Survey is tied to the to Illinois. And, um, and I could do it while I was working. So I started the PhD in the fall of 2005. I defended on December 12th of, 20, of 2012 at noon. So lots of 12s in there. Um, and, um, you know, it took a little bit longer maybe than I had hoped or I had anticipated. Um, and that whole time, those whole, that whole seven years, like my professional life was just getting busier and crazier and more travel. And I probably traveled around the world, like three or four times, like in that time period. And I mean, it was, you can ask Michelle, she, I'm sure she remembers it was insane. And so I was doing that and I was trying to do a PhD and yeah, um, perhaps not the best timing. Um, but, you know, what I ended up doing a PhD in was whether or not you could use Facebook as a viable engagement tool to get people to sort of shift their attitudes about um, global climate change. So it was a really fun time to be doing a PhD. Um, and, and clearly, if anybody picked up on it, I, I don't have the, I've never had the traditional path to uh, anything. Like I came to Alfred, I was 28. Michelle, Michelle is five years older than me. We were, if we were closer in age to each other than either of us was to the students. And, um, you know, that was one of the, you know, we spent a lot, I spent a lot of time with Michelle uh, uh, for that reason. And um, uh, you know, just, and then the opportunity to do that PhD, it was just too good to turn down. But the advice that I give everybody, and I just was talking to a couple of students recently, is that if you're going to do a PhD, you have to have an abnormal um, desire and, and, and crazy dedication, you know, like you have to want it for irrational reasons because there's gonna come a point somewhere in the process where you're like, yeah, this seemed like a good idea at the time, but it is no longer a good idea. And if you're gonna finish, then you really need to be able to stick, to be uncomfortable and stick with it for as long as it takes to get it done. Um, Sherman had a question there. Sherman, do you wanna ask it in person? Well, I'm all right just having it in the chat, but but I'm I'm a non-scientist. My background is in art and architecture. So I've read more about embedded carbon in the built environment than about sequestered carbon in the in the deep sandstones. Sure. I just wanted once you've sequestered all that carbon, is there anything you can do with it or just stick stick it in the closet and hope, hope it doesn't escape? <laughs> So uh, thank you for the question. That's a great question. Um, what you're actually doing is that you are uh, seeking to permanently store that carbon dioxide in pore space in rock deep beneath the, the surface. So the way that I like to explain it is, if you think about a crate of oranges, those oranges are spheres and they touch each other in a lot of places, but there are hourglass spaces in between all of those oranges. Deep 
deep in the subsurface, and in, in Decatur, I'm talking at about 6,800 feet beneath the surface, you have a sandstone that's a bunch of spheres that has pore spaces in it. And right now, if you before you went to store something in that pore space, it has, uh, there is brine, six or seven times saltier than the ocean that lives in that pore space. So there's no open air. Um, it's, it's all, any available space is filled with water, brine, oil, gas, some sort of substance. So what you're doing when you're storing carbon dioxide is you're capturing that carbon dioxide, you're compressing it because it's a compressible gas, you're removing any water, and then you're injecting it in a well that is essentially like injecting a liquid into a liquid, into that rock. So um, what you're doing is permanently storing it in those pore spaces uh, so that it is not going into the atmosphere because it's primarily a climate mitigation strategy to reduce the amount of emissions that we are uh, emitting in the, in the atmosphere. And then one last piece to that is that typically if this was your sandstone, you want to have a different rock type on, on top of that, like a shale, which does not allow something to pass through it. So that um, when you, uh, carbon dioxide is less dense than water or brine. So it could migrate upward and you want to make sure that it doesn't because your whole point in the storage is that it does not then leak to the surface. So you are always looking for that package of rock, a sandstone that you would use as a storage unit and a shale that you would use as a cap or a seal. So, so carbon that's, that's embedded in a building is not, not as secure as carbon that's in sandstone with shale on top of it, but it no. still is better than being in the atmosphere. Yeah, so I would, I, I, you know, I would, I don't, I'm not sure I would agree that it's not permanently stored because if, you know, we use carbon dioxide in cements and a lot of other, there's a lot of work right now in the utilization space where um, uh, using carbon uh, as, you know, in building materials and, and nanotechnologies and things like that. So I do think that there are other ways to permanently store. It's just volumetrically, what you can do through carbon capture and storage is by far and away much, much greater than what you can do through all the other technologies that we have available to us at this time. So we're in a hurry about climate change. Yeah. Right? Oh, yeah. And yeah. And so that's the that's the thing that makes carbon capture and storage important for this point in time is that it gives us the ability to have the, the most impact the fastest. Thanks. You're welcome. Thank you for the question. Other questions? I have Shall a question for you. Um, we were just talking in our climate change class this morning, we were just talking about how coastal properties uh, are at increased risk of damage, yet the, the, the value of coastal property is increasing faster than non-coastal property. So people make decisions while knowing that their properties are at risk, make decisions to value more these types of places. So they're clearly as a, um, um, th there's a time scale thing here where they see it as a long climate change and sea level rise as a longer term problem. And you, the, the farmer you talk to sees his main issue as being his property value is a, he might be close to retiring and might have a, a, a short term impact on him that's important to him. How do you convince people that these solutions like carbon storage are important, even though they they're a, a, a solution for a, what people perceive as a long-term problem? So uh, interesting question. First, I would say that I never try to convince anybody of anything. I go into every engagement uh, open and um, with a learner mindset to understand what it is that is important to the people that I am talking to. And you know, I can, I'm an expert at explaining how carbon capture and storage works and also an expert in understanding what 
um, you know, what questions somebody is asking or, or has um, that may or may not um, lead them to make a decision to be supportive. But it is not it is not mine, nor is it necessarily anybody else's role to convince other people to do things that they are not happy about. Um, you know, uh, in, in telling that story about the farmer, there's a lot that I left out. And um, farmers are really interesting. Um, I, I'm hearing background noise. I don't know if you can hear that or not, but the cat might make an appearance here in a minute. So just, just be forewarned. Um, uh, um, farmers are really interesting stakeholder. They are, yeah, he was worried about his property value in that instance, but it's so much deeper than that because for a farmer, his identity is tied up in that land. His legacy is tied up in that land, his history, his, his net worth, and what he passes on to his children and his grandchildren is all tied up in that. So he, it is not a simple equation of whether or not uh, this impacts my property value. And, you know, and I probably misrepresented that in my story because for, and we're de we deal with this all the time in Illinois where I'm based, is you know people don't want pipelines through their property. They are not convinced that this is a good idea, even if people uh, corporations are offering to give them money, um, you know, for access to their property. So you know, how do you get this done? Is a really really messy, complicated space where um, you know you have to have prolonged opportunity to engage with people. Um, I had a conversation with a landowner who's been approached by a pipeline company um, and a storage, a carbon storage company, and they want to store CO2 under their property. And they're the second largest landowner in the county where they live. And she said to me, you know, they, they've been talking to us since last October. And at first I was like, hell no, we're not doing that. And then, you know, now she was calling me, this was like a week or two ago, to ask me questions and to better understand some things that she still didn't understand. But she told me she had changed her mind and they were getting ready to sign some sort of agreement. And I asked her, I was like, what's the thing that changed your mind, you know, in less, in nine months time? And she said it was the fact that Every question that they asked got answered, that the company was willing to meet with them, you know, more than eight different times with different um, project partners to talk to them and their neighbors, and that they built a relationship with these, with this, you know, company, this set of project developers to the point where they had, you know, built trust and felt like, um, you know, they had an understanding of what was happening. And these people had the foresight and the, um, uh, you know, wherewithal to dig deeper and have more conversations about something that impacted their land than just categorically saying no. Thank you. <laughs> Good questions. Here's a here's a more straightforward question. Does the does the carbon dioxide displace the brine or does it dissolve in the brine or is it a combination of the two? And if if it's displacing the brine, where does the brine go? Such a geochemist question. I know, I know, I know. I can't help it. Um so uh and I would have expected nothing else. Um <laughs> the um uh so it's kind of a combination. So the carbon, some of the carbon dioxide goes into solution, into the brine, and ultimately mineralizes. So, you know, your brine is calcium, magnesium, iron, uh, manganese, um, chloride, iodide, um, CO2, HCO3, you know, a variety of cations and anions, because that's what makes it salty. And so some of that will, you know, there's buffering that happens, 
in the, you know, in the brine, but that stuff all happens pretty quickly, the buffering at least. Um, but over the long term, you have the potential for mineralization, but the kinetics of that, as you know, are slow, right? So some of that is going to get taken up into sort of secondary or tertiary cements, most likely. Um, and then you do have some brine displacement. And so one of the things that you're required by the EPA to monitor is not just the plume front, but the plume pressure front. And so that is the area of um, brine movement, hydrogeologic um, you know, conductivity, conductivity in the subsurface that you have to also be aware of what is happening um, with respect to your plume impact. And that area is called the area of review. And that's something that you have to continually monitor and, and create models for and update models for uh, so that you can demonstrate that you understand what's happening with that plume pressure front. Makes sense. Any other questions for Sally? Okay, before we thank her again, let me just uh, announce next week's speaker is Kari Germanson Martin, um, who is also an alum and she works for an organization called Clean Ocean Action. So she will be talking to us about uh, plastics in the ocean. And, um, but in the meantime, thank you so much, Sally. I am wish you were here, but I'm glad that we were able to do this anyway. And yeah, me too. It was a great talk. Thank you. Thank you. It was really fun. It would have been more fun in Alfred, but it was really fun. All Thanks. right. Guys, next week.